Hey YouTube, Repo Man 64. Oh, just finished work. I got to shave. Um, I wanted my last video to be my last video, but I found something. I want to pass it by everyone out there to take a look at it and see if you see what I'm seeing. Um, I guess we'll get right into it. It's uh, for me, it's quite a quite a discovery. Okay, let's go here to Leviticus 23. First, we learn that you will work six days, and on the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. This represents the six days of creation, and on the seventh day God rested. It sets it up for us that the Sabbath, which means Sabado in Spanish, Saturday, and then Sunday being the first day of the week. So we go here to the Feast of Passover. We learn in here that on the 14th day of the first month at even, which I will say is 3 o'clock in the afternoon when Jesus died on the cross, is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month, he, he clarifies, he wants us to understand that the next day is a week of unleavened bread. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread, and in the first day ye shall have an holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. It is a Saturday again. But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days, and in the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. Now, the Feast of first fruits. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord. This is the wave sheaf offering. When did it happen? It had to happen after this week here. And you shall offer that day when the wave sheaf offering and lamb without blemish, this is Jesus, the first year of the, of the of a burnt offering unto the Lord, and the meat offering thereof shall be two tenths. Deals of fine flour mingled. So it goes into uh, what he expects in there. Now, we come to the Feast of Pentecost. What is a Pentecost? I showed you in the last video that we had a happy Pentecost and then a sad Pentecost and then a happy Pentecost and then a sad Pentecost. But that's not true. A Pentecost is a count of 50. And what happens at that count of 50? It is a when everything that you had 50 years goes by, everything that you sold to the wealthy man, everyone around him, that he purchased land, he purchased people, there were slaves, everybody was returned whole back to where they began after 50 years. Who's happy here? Everyone, except the owner. He's the only one not happy because he's losing all the land, he's losing all the slaves, he's losing everything that he had for those previous 50 years. So is Pentecost a sad day ever? No, it is a joyous day. Who rules this world right now? Satan. Who will have to give us up at the end? Satan. Satan is the ruler of this world. Who will be sad on this day? Only Satan. All of us are going to be extremely joyous because on Pentecost is the day that we will be released and go back who, uh, who redeemed us to Jesus Christ, okay? Now, this is where I saw this before. I even had it on my timeline, and I changed it because there were so many saying you simply count 50, but that is not what we see here. Ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, which means Sabbath is Saturday. The day after Sabbath is Sunday. You will count from the Sunday, from that day, you brought the wave sheaf offering. When was the wave sheaf offering brought? Remember, Jesus resurrected. He spent the day, but then he disappears until he sees Thomas in the upper room on Sunday. When did Jesus bring the wave sheaf offering? He went to heaven for those seven days, and on the seventh day, as we saw back here, 
he performed the wave sheaf offering, paying for our sins. We are in the age of grace. We will be in the age of grace until the end of tribulation. Grace means that we are being saved from hellfire. We are not being saved from tribulation. We're not being saved from the millennium. Every group who comes in at a different time will be saved from hellfire. Now, on Sunday, the day that Jesus sees Thomas in the upper room, that morning, just like when he rose Sunday early in the morning, he makes the wave sheaf offering in heaven. He returns to earth on Sunday afternoon. All of the apostles are in the upper room, including Thomas, and Thomas touches him. This day is a Sunday. It's the self-same day. It's the same exact day that he rose. Exactly, it would be the eighth day because he rose on Sunday. Back to Sunday again would be the eighth day. When do you begin your count? If the wave sheaf offering happened on Sunday, when do you make your count? Well, it clearly says it without, a, without question. You shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath. When he does the wave sheaf offering on Sunday, you will begin your count the morrow after the Sabbath. Sabbath is still seven days away. It is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It will be seven days. Then, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, then you will count 50 days. And guess where you wind up at? You wind up on a Sunday again. Every single Pentecost will land on a Sunday. Remember, when you're looking at a calendar, look at 2022 because the Gregorian calendar is actually correct on what day things landed in 2022. They are not correct again until the year 3033. So what we read here is there's this gap from the wave sheaf offering, from the day that you brought the wave sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. It is not complete the first set because it is a Sunday when he brings the wave sheaf offering, the day that he sees Thomas in the upper room. Those seven days are added to the 50. There's a little, I don't want to say trick in here, but if you have to dive deep into this to see this kind of stuff. And I've been, this has been breaking my mind forever. And the thing that bothered me the most is that if Pentecost truly landed on Tishabiyav, this is not a happy day. This is a very sad day. This is the day the two temples were destroyed. This is the day that 15,000 would die as all the men dug their graves and in the morning everyone would rise except for 15,000. It doesn't sound like a return to me. That sounds like a judgment. All right. Let me continue on here with this. Let's go. Let me go. Let's see. I wanted to. Well, I'll do that later. I'll do that in a minute. Let me do this here first. I changed everything. Okay. Jesus rises. Forget about my date. I know. I know that uh, sticking to this Gregorian timeline might be difficult for anyone to understand, but no one can argue the the uh, Hebrew dates. We know. Excuse me. That Jesus went to the cross on Nisan 14. End of discussion. The Bible clearly says it. The first month and the 14th day. We know he was in the belly of the whale. I'm sorry, in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. On, March, on, on Nisan 14 would have been a Wednesday. When he rose, it was a Sunday morning. This is April the 3rd. He completes April the 2nd. You see down here at the bottom, Nisan 17. He completes April the 2nd and he rises when... Night falls at some point. We don't know when. The Bible does not tell us. Then he walks around with everyone for a few hours until the afternoon, and then he disappears. He returns. We don't hear a word about him until he returns on Sunday to Thomas in the upper room. Okay? What is he doing in heaven? He has to wait until the seventh day for the wave sheaf offering that I just showed you in Leviticus. Those seven days, you can see down there, first and second column say seven days. The first column is discussing the time. There's two timelines running here side by side. 
the three days Jesus was in the grave, the seven days Jesus was in heaven and returned to Thomas in the upper room, the seven days of no bread, and three days, finally, he cooks on the shore when the apostles come to see him. And then he walks with them or is seen of them for 40 days until he ascends on Sivan 15. This is also the day that Moses ascends to Mount Sinai. And what happens to Moses when he ascends into Mount Sinai? He sits in a cloud, in a mist, the Bible says. He sits there for seven days. At the end of seven days, God removes the veil. What has just happened? What does that make you think of when God removed the veil? He married Israel. He married them. He married them. And seven days later, when he removed the veil, he was married to them. They were in waiting. No, uh, Moses was in waiting in Mount Sinai in the mist for seven days until that veil was lifted, until they were married on the seventh day. This is a happy day. This is a Pentecost. It is a failed Pentecost, if I might say it that way. <laughs> I hope I can say it that way. It is a failed Pentecost because Israel went whoring around with false idols. They built a golden calf. So when Moses comes down from the mountain 40 days later, he throws down the tablets on the first of all. I show that as July 16th. That's debatable. But the first of all, the tablets were thrown down. He goes back up. This is where God divorces Israel and is going to marry us. The, the bride. This is these are the wives. He was he married he already married them and he divorced them after forty days. And then Moses comes back up, gets the law again, because he's not giving up on Israel yet, and he returns on the ninth of Av. Kishabiav. He returns on the ninth of Av with the law. You want to live under the law? You live under the law. If you like the law, live under the law. You will be judged by the law. If you have faith in Jesus as the end of all ends, that Jesus Christ is God Almighty and fully covered your sins, there is no good work that you've ever done to deserve any of this, to warrant any of this. No one, and I mean no one, will show up in heaven going, oh yeah, I'm here because I I figured this out, or I gave to the poor, or I... I fasted for a week straight, or there's no one that will show up in heaven with that mindset. Anyone of us that winds up as the bride, shows up in heaven before all these things come to pass. Just like it says, to escape all these things. Anyone. We are now coming up on, and I would say on September the 11th, it will be exactly 6,000 years from creation. Adam was in the garden for seven years, and in the eighth year, in the second month and 17th day, just exactly the same day the flood began, um, from that day is the year 2030. It is seven years after the, the, the beginning of creation. Things happened after creation, but the, the, the flood happened after creation, like uh, 40, what is it, 40 days, I think, after creation. Um, but yeah, I think it was 40 days, but, um, creation is where God says the beginning from the end, the first and the last, this is the beginning, September the 11th, a little 28 is the first day of creation. When did God rest? So we have a Pentecost here. I moved it because of those 57 days. You see down here from the wave sheaf offering, Thomas in the upper room, on a Sunday, you begin your count on the Sabbath after. He's very specific about it when he says it in Leviticus. It's, it's hard to see, but it, it, you, don't, you have to know what day you're starting on. It doesn't even matter if you started on Wednesday. You have to go to the Sabbath and count from there. Thomas was seen in the upper room exactly seven days, eight days inclusive, days later after Jesus rises and defeats death. The Bible records that very clearly. It's a Sunday. When do you begin your count? You begin it on Saturday. If you go from 
Thomas in the upper room, and you go 50 days, you will land on the day that God marries Israel. And seven days later, the veil is removed. It is a happy day. God has married Israel. The veil is removed. The, the mist is removed. And Moses can now see. And the law is being given to him. It doesn't take them uh, but a short period of time uh, for them to completely disappoint God and, uh, and cheat on him. And so God divorces Israel on that after that Pentecost. But it's still a joyous day. Then... From, remember the Pentecost ends on the day Jesus ascends. Seven days and 50 days later. Let's see, no, 50 days and then seven days uh, to Pentecost is when Moses, was the veil was removed and God married Israel. Then 50 days brings us to Tisha B'Av. That just happened for me on July 24th. But... Again, those seven days, those seven days are missing. You have to count from the Sabbath after. And when you do, the Pentecost that fully came, the Pentecost for the bride. Remember, this Pentecost failed because Israel cheated and God divorced them. This is the new Pentecost. This is a happy day. This is to be odd. This is the day that the brides dance around in the field while they're... Uh, Bridegrooms come and choose them. This happens on July 30th. That's why I had to get this out. It's three days from now. This is the 15th of Av. When you do a, a count from the beginning, it's July 30th. Others would say, Google will say August the 1st or 2nd, I believe. Uh, I'm still going off of March 17th as being the head of the year. And I'm still going off of the fact that uh, you don't have months that have 27 days in it just so you can accommodate the moon and other months that have 35 days in it so you can accommodate the moon I, I, I believe that when the sun comes up you assign it a day and then the next day when the sun comes up you assign it a day and I don't believe that there are, even on the Gregorian calendar there's any months that go over uh, 31 days and there's no month that is less than uh, February which they've simply taken from other months if they hadn't they would almost mirror Enoch's timeline perfectly here so here we are coming up on Tisha B'Av I'm sorry coming up on Tu B'Av on July 30th now we have to do that count again and this is what shocked me I didn't know this but this is what shocked me from Tubi of July 30th, which is the 15th of August. You count 15 days, I'm sorry, 50 days. And where do you land? You land on September the 17th. This is the day God rested from all his work. This is the last day of creation. Creation began on 9-1-1. It ended on 9-17. On 9-17, God rested. But wait. Where are those seven days? Where did I go here? Oh, God rested from all his work. And then seven days later is what? It is a Pentecost. Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. It is the end of the ten days of all. This is what I'm suggesting. The Jews were supposed to be raptured right here, but God divorced them. I believe the bride is supposed to be raptured here on Tubiov, which is a perfect scenario of the women dancing out in the field, the brides dancing around, the virgins dancing around. And then 50 days later, I think that perhaps the Day of Atonement um, is the day that the saints go marching home, a great multitude that no man can count in this sixth seal. Again, I don't know how long those seals will last, Will they last 57 days? I don't know. Will they last six days, seven days? I don't know. Will it be 153 days? Will it be five months? Will it be one year and 10 days? I don't know exactly. I don't know that that is for us to know. That is just like Elisha uh, when Elijah was taken right in front of him. What did Elisha do wrong? He was following Elijah. Why didn't he go? He didn't go because when they asked him, today's the day 
that your master would be taken away from you. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard, I've heard this so many times. And in every single town they went to, you don't hear a word out of Elijah, but you hear the townspeople talking to Elisha. And, and Elisha's response is the same each time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. He doesn't want to hear about it. He's got plans. He's got things going on. He's still following. He's still believing. But that chariot came down and separated the two. Elisha was taken, Elisha stayed behind, but Elisha threw down, which is, represents the Holy Spirit coming back down uh, to Elisha. Elisha strikes the water, crosses on dry ground, puts on the cloak of God, and what is he doing? He is researching, and hopefully, hopefully the saints, the great multitude, will become greater researchers than us. I just saw something on Facebook a little while ago. I thought it was really cool, and uh, this guy says, um, and as a matter of fact, uh, I heard that uh, this is the moment where God married Israel and divorced Israel. It made so much sense when he said it. It's a, it's a YouTube channel. Um, he spent a little time um, dogging out another channel. I would, you know who you are uh, when you see this because I made a comment on your, your, uh, in your comment section on your YouTube Spend less time worrying about other watchers. And remember, we're all in this. And he kind of did a follow-up video today, somewhat apologizing um, in that he's also called dates, not rapture dates, but high wash dates, and they came to pass. And we're all just trying to figure this out. But what I saw on Facebook was if you are trying to figure this out and you keep getting it wrong, there is a whole planet full of people that don't care, that are not trying to figure this out. If you're here watching, if you're looking at the timeline, if you're listening to all these other channels, they are all, and I'll tell this to that guy, they are all wonderful. There is only one litmus test that I look for in anyone that has a channel. Jesus Christ is God Almighty. He came here, left his rightful place in heaven. He came here in human form gave up his deity to walk this planet only to be scourged, spit on, whipped, drug across up a, a, a hill and then nailed to it and left there to die. He gave up the ghost. Uh, and then, in, what does it say then? At three o'clock in the afternoon. And then three days later, he rose and conquered death and made that wave sheaf offering covering us for our sins. Who did he cover? For those sins. He covered anyone who will not go to hell. Anyone who's not going to hell. And that is the bride. That's the saints. And that's the, the uh, millennial saints. The ones who go through the millennium for the thousand years. There are different groups. I don't want to get into the, to, to the different groups. But the Bible is very specific and very clear on those three different groups. Now. Where was it? Oh, uh, if you're looking and trying to figure this out, that's a wonderful thing. That's awesome. Okay. It's about to happen. It is about to happen. And if I'm right, and you can see it right there in Leviticus 23, where you begin, where Jesus does see Thomas in the upper room, you tie those verses together, and then you begin your count from the Sabbath after, and then you go your 50 days. The, the count falls exactly like I'm showing you. And it's amazing how it, the, uh, the Pentecost lands right there on Yom Kippur, which is exactly seven days after God rested. I couldn't make this stuff fit if I wanted to. And when I finally saw those, the, the distance between Pentecost, Pentecost is 50 days, but you'll begin your count on the Sabbath after. It's actually 57 days in between each Pentecost. So... Let me get back into this. I don't want to take up too much time here today. And again, where are we looking? We're looking for the second Pentecost to be of when you do that, what I, what I believe to be the proper math from the Sabbath after, you will always land on the 15th of Av, which is to be of, which for me is happening on July 30th. And for Google, I think it's August 1st or 2nd, something like that. I don't, I don't really look at Google. So... Now, the fun part of the video. I want you to dare to dream. 
you spend your day thinking, man, I wouldn't mind having that car. I wouldn't mind having that job and making more money. I wouldn't mind having that house. I wouldn't mind, you know, uh, being able to pay off my student loans or just millions, you know, I want to go to this college. I want to do this thing and I want to do that thing. All of those things are tying you to this earth. And I can tell you how many decisions I've made since I was in my 20s and I believed that this was going to happen, that I avoided doing this or doing that because I said there's no long-term purpose here on earth. The long term is in heaven. Um, I've always been like that. It's not, I'm not better than anyone else. I am absolutely amazed at the new Christians that come in, that God is showing them some incredible stuff. And I'm, my mind is blown by what they find out. And I'm just like, that's not fair. I've been doing this for, no, I don't do that. I learn from them because if you could say Jesus Christ is God almighty and he died on the cross for your sins and he made that offering and covered your sins with his blood. If you can say that, everything else is just a study. And that's what we're doing. We're just studying and we're trying to figure this out. So I challenge you to dream about what heaven will look like. What will heaven look like? Well, I took a few pics from Google. <laughs> it is a massive city that God said exists in heaven. This city will set down on the new heaven come from the I'm sorry, from the new heaven down here on the new earth that will be created at the end of the millennium. The day the earth and heaven pass away, nobody knows that day or hour. It specifically tells us in Matthew twenty four thirty six. If you read Matthew twenty four thirty five, it specifically tells us that the heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. No man knows the day or the hour of the earth and heaven passing away. It's super clear. So there is this mansions, many, many, many mansions that are built in heaven that Jesus has been preparing for us. And if it were not so, he would have told us, dare to dream in this mansion, in this holy city, the streets are lined with pure gold. It's so pure that it's as transparent as glass. And when you walk, you are walking on gold. That's how important you are. You have no idea how big God is, I think, sometimes, and how deep he will cover anything that you ever did. If you will only ask, if you will only ask him, just ask, humble yourself. There is no sin you've committed, and I don't care what you've done, where if you'll just humble yourself, go to your prayer closet by yourself, Nobody needs to know. Just like in, uh, now I'm going to forget, Matthew 6, 5 and 6. Go in there and just pour yourself out. If you don't know how to pray, who cares? He's your best friend. He's your only chance. You have no other way. What kind of mansion are you going to have in heaven? One on a big piece of property like this? Huge, huge mansion. Now, whoa. for all of you that say, and I get the comments, well, you're just trying to make heaven materialistic. What do you think you're going to be doing when you get there? Do you think you're going to be sitting on a cloud playing a harp? No. Heaven will be, the Bible says, greater than anything you could, whatever you could possibly imagine. These pictures are just an imagination. Whatever I show you and whatever picture I paint for you that heaven might be like, it pales deeply by comparison to what heaven actually is. Dare to dream. Don't dream about material things. Dream about what heaven will look like. I'm not telling you that, oh, we're just trying to bring earth to heaven. Everything we have here is stuff that, and, and I showed you that verse before, where this guy didn't know how to make anything, but God gave him the knowledge. I think that a lot of these painters and pictures and stuff of heaven are delivered to people by God and given the the the, the uh, artistic ability to paint these pictures and to dream up these dreams and they don't just come from nowhere they come from heaven. So let me get back into this. Will there be mansions? Yes, Jesus said there would be. I go to prepare in my Father's house. There are many mansions. If it were not so, I would tell you. I go to prepare a place for you. What's next?
Look at the size of that. Can you imagine? Now again, not being materialistic, I am telling you that Jesus built you a mansion. And it is exactly what you are looking for. When you get there, it's going to be like, almost like he read your mind. Wow, look at that. Can you imagine? My goodness, the grass will never grow higher than it's supposed to. I would imagine there's people in this world that just love I see a guy on Facebook all the time. He just knocks on people's houses randomly and says, can I mow your lawn for free? Because I just love seeing a clean lawn. This guy does this stuff for free. He just loves that. And there will be people up there who will tend to gardens. They'll tend to houses they'll tend, they, because they love it. They absolutely love it. And that's what they will want to do. Look at that mansion. Whoa, look at that mansion. Another mansion. There's so many mansions in heaven. Whoa, swimming pool mansion. It's like a mansion. Do you see that down at the bottom? It's like glass down there. It's like a mansion on top of a mansion or something. <laughs> I don't know what that is. There's a landing pad, I think. So that'd be cool. How about a mansion out in the woods? Log cabin. Fire pit out front. Is that more your style? Is that what you would be looking for? How about a, a, a ranch house out in the uh, out in the snow? Would, would that be what you'd be looking for? That'd be awesome. All right. You don't want your own... Uh, your own mansion, but you want a mansion inside of a building. Well, there you go. Mansion inside of a building overlooking the ocean. Hmm. Another one overlooking the skyline of the city. Wow. And when you get there, there's going to be a candy store. Um, Wackadoodle Samoan says he'll ha we'll have the Wack Shack. And when we get there, we'll be able to see all of the, the different styles of candy and everything you could possibly imagine. Again, if you can imagine it here, it'll be so much more glorious in heaven. So much more glorious. You don't think there's going to be streets where we're going to be walking around on uh, clouds? Well, I mean, the Bible does say the streets will be lined with gold. It'll be so such pure gold, it'll look like glass. So I'm, I'm going to lean towards that. We don't have to eat, but we will. The Bible clearly says that we're going to sit at a banquet, and we're going to drink wine with Jesus, and we're going to have anything as a matter of fact the bible clearly says that jesus you will be laid back in a chair and jesus will come to you dressed in a waiter's outfit and ask you sir what would you like for dinner and you will tell him he will serve you i've shown you that before in previous videos what kind of car you want yeah i don't know if there's going to be cars in heaven or not but just imagine you know, like I said in one of my videos, I, I need a big mud truck, I need a sports car, and uh, I need a, a, a Hayabusa or, or a sport bike that's out of this world. I love riding sport bike. Look at all those bikes. How about a toy store for the kids? You know there's going to be children in heaven, lots and lots of children. I'm guessing that when I get there, um, if certain family members didn't make it and they have children, I will have to assist in raising them um, when we're there. But they're going to be perfect. They can't get hurt if they run off and do, go do something. You simply call them and they'll come back. There won't be any fear of them being taken. And it's just going to be a blast just to watch them run and play. Because honestly, children, when Jesus picked up that child, he said, this is what will be in heaven and that will be a lot a lot of children that happened isaiah 53 what did you do here i thank thee and praise thee O thou god of my fathers who hast given me wisdom and might and hast made me known unto me now what we desire of thee for thou hast for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter I guess this is Daniel 23, and I uh, copied it because it clearly says that God makes known these things to us as we need them to be known to us. Uh, 153 days. Oh, I noticed that from Thomas in the upper room. It's another 153 days, by the way. April the 10th, which is Nisan 25, which is the day that Jesus visits Thomas in the upper room. If you go 153 days... It lands one day before creation begins, and creation begins on September the 11th. So I found that to be uh, uh, another 153-day mark. I actually need to write that down. 153 days to uh, creation, the first day of creation. So, 
uh, yeah, September the 11th is the day that God began creating the world, and it is the day that Satan chose to bring down two towers and kill so many people, almost 3,000. Look at that number, 3,000, huh? I didn't realize that. 3,000? Hmm, that's something to look at, right? That's interesting that that happened. Anyway, all right, so this, I, I went quickly through that. Um, don't feel like I had much time. It is a possibility. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I believe that the Pentecost, we had mistakenly put it on Tishabiyah when it's actually, we had to count from the Sabbath after, and it lands on Tubiyah, which is a joyous day, which is when you return everything back to the original owner. And uh, the only person sad in that scenario is the uh, the guy who had it, which is Satan. So keep looking up, Repo Man 64 like, comment, share, and subscribe, and go to a quiet place by yourself. And nobody needs to know, and you don't need to tell anybody. And accept the Lord in your heart. We are running out of time. Very quickly, we're running out of time. And uh, if I find anything, I hope this is my last video. <laughs> But if I find anything, I will bring it to you, and uh, we can go into Discord and discuss if, uh, if you see what I'm saying or if you think it's completely wrong. Let me know. We'll chat with you later.